so our panels will uh, mostly go, you will have always a person who is introducing the panel in this case. It's going to be me. My name is Istvan Kish. I'm the executive director of the New Institute. Uh, we will always have a keynote speaker and then the other panelists would reflect to that uh, keynote speaker and of course share their own thoughts on the topic. Um, in this case, our keynote speaker is going to be James Carfano. Uh, everybody has a very distinguished bio, which you can see at your uh, seat, so I will not go through, through everybody's uh, very distinguished uh, biography necessarily. I will just try to pinpoint some uh, perhaps most important achievements uh, <laughs> our panelists uh, have. So our first speaker will be James Carfano, who is the Vice President of the Heritage Foundation and who is also a leading expert in national security and foreign policy challenges in the United States. Uh, perhaps uh, what everybody knows that he's also an accomplished historian. Uh, I think one of the first books I, I read from you actually was uh, a book which I can't remember the exact title, but it was about uh, how um, different kind of um, in the Second World War, how <laughs> they were using devices. Yeah, I don't uh, remember my books either. So, uh... <laughs> no, but I was—I was—I I read it <laughs> during my university studies, and I found it really interesting because I'm a—I'm a history buff, buff myself, and uh, it was really interesting how, uh, in the Second World War, they were using all these different gadgets to. <laughs> um, to f uh, help fight the war. Um, just for Prime Minister, I just did a book on uh, Papua New Guinea, and the Australians were awesome. So <laughs> uh, I said he didn't read that book, but hopefully I will be able to. <laughs> um, so Mr. Carfano also has a long established career in the army. Uh, you served for about uh, 25 years in the army, and you also uh, reached the rank of lieutenant colonel. Uh, and you were also a professor at Hillsdale College and at uh, National Defense University. Um, so I would now kindly ask you uh, to give your opening speech. Uh, and also I would kindly ask you to try to fit into the 15 minute uh, right. time frame. I, I'm a New Yorker, we talk fast, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, first of all, this is an amazing venue. Our hosts are amazing people and we should all applaud them because they are. <laughs> And this is amazing. This is more people than showed up for my wedding. So I am so, so excited. Actually, could you guys just, good. Great, thank you. Thank, all right, good. Um, so uh, I w I'd like to talk a minute about the role of America in this geopolitical uh, transformation. Um, and you know, conceptually, you, we always had the saying that politics ends at the water's edge. And, and you know, that was generally true in American politics, you know, with some exceptions. And the reason for that is if you look at the nature of American political parties, or two major political parties, really throughout um, most of what I would call our, our modern history, um, they, the, the parties themselves were actually diverse. You know, Vietnam War is a good example where you, where you could find very powerful hawks uh, and liberals in both parties. And that was actually quite common. And, um, you know, you, and we've seen this transformation of uh, the American political system really over the last uh, two decades. So if you think, for example, when, when Bill Clinton was president and, and in deep trouble in his presidency, what he did was he actually pivoted to the middle, right? He actually, he actually went to more moderate politics. Um, and he could get away with that because his party would let him, because there was diversity in his party, uh, and he could build on the moderates in his own party and partner with the moderates in the other party and build a, a, you know, a coalition. And, and over the last two decades, we've seen the nature of America's political parties in Washington demonstrably evolve. Uh, so for example, we used to have what we call blue dog Democrats who were maybe d domestically very, um, um, liberal, but on foreign policy, were actually quite hawkish. Uh, and, you know, suddenly on the Republic, I was from New York. Um, we were, but we, I was born apparently a Democrat. I didn't know this. Um, we later became Republicans, and I asked my father why we became Republicans. And he said the Republican Club had a better bar. Because um, it, I mean, it was like the old Coke and Pepsi joke. You could, you know, switch it. Democratic, but it didn't really matter in New York. So, um, so now that what we have is, is really ideologically much more pure political parties on both left and right. And, and that has actually bled over into our foreign policy. 
and um, in 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 concert with kind of the the, the America not deciding what it's how it's going to fulfill its role will grow. We do see these kind of flip flops back and forth between an Obama and, and a Trump and a back to a uh, Biden, and um, and that's not going to stop. Um, and so politics not only doesn't end at the water's edge, uh, po foreign policy is now an extension of American domestic politics. And so on the, on the one hand, you see very clearly from the Obama and the Biden administration, a tendency to, to really make foreign policy an extension of a domestic political agenda. Uh, and, you, and, that's, and, and reflexively on the other side, um, Trump, you know, if you actually Trump's foreign policy isn't really Trump in, it's really kind of more normalized Republican policy, which is essentially realist, which is, you know, foreign policy ought to be based on kind of a realist political agenda, America's vital interest. Um, and so that's going to continue to happen. And, and in, the, in the U.S. system, uh, because the, the president has so much preponderance in foreign policy, even with the checks and balances of congressional and uh, judicial oversight, um, that that flip flop is is going to continue to occur. Here's what's changing, and here's what you ought to pay attention to. One is because politics at the national level have essentially become stagnated and Manichaean, um, and 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 essentially a minority president or president, a very bare majority, essentially can have a maximalist agenda. What's happened in American politics is is the kind of diversity and seeking of consensus and, and, and the larger kind of um, majority view has devolved to state and local politics. And what we're seeing in America is state and local politics are driving the national agenda. So if you, for, you know, for example, we have a president now who's deeply unpopular, despite the fact um, that uh, he, he won a national election. He has um, an extraordinarily strong support in the public media, extraordinarily strong support from many civic institutions, Hollywood, universities, you name it, um, dominant political voices in, in uh, polity that support him. And yet he's completely underwater on almost every key issue Americans care about. Uh, inflation, immigration, border security, critical race theory, election integrity. You know, how is that possible? And it's, it's possible because um, the, the, the freezing of black and white at the state level um, is not happening at the, the state and local level. And we're actually starting to see state and local politics drive up into the national agenda. And why is that important? Because I actually do think that breeds over to foreign policy. I think what we've actually seen in the combination of Trump and Biden is something really, really interesting, and that is how America sees its role in the world. First of all, I would say is, um, you know, look, Trump was neither an isolationist um, nor was he obviously a neocon, right? And and those were kind of the the the, the twin things that we wax that we jump back and forth on between the Bush era, which is you know, we can make the world safe, but essentially by going out and and, and and imposing our will on everybody, and the Obama policy, which essentially let, we're going to withdraw from the world um, unless unless there's a you, something in our leftist agenda that, that reinforces it. Uh, and 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 what Trump really offered was this middle ground that America is neither going to be isolationist nor are we going to be the world's conquerors, but we're going to defend America's vital interests. And as a consequence of that, um, that that would mean that that we would do things that were actually generally. Uh, ameliorative to, to, the, to the world order because it did require pushing back on the major disruptive forces in the world like Iran and China uh, and Russia. So what did Trump prove? I mean, if you look at, um, at the election, um, Trump may have lost for a lot of reasons, but foreign policy wasn't one of them. Uh, there's literally nothing that was brought to the, other than the fact that the adults are back, which proved actually that wasn't maybe the best thing. Um, that 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 they actually brought to the table. Uh, I think Trump demonstrated a couple of things, and I'll just finish on this. Uh, one is I think he demonstrated that an American president can be a peace through strength president and enjoyed a wide majority of public support, even among Republicans and conservatives, sometimes who are skeptical of, of large military spending and, and of military adventurism. They they had a compact with Trump, which is you can have a strong military. That's fine as long as you're not using it recklessly. So he managed to co-opt everybody from say you know Rand Paul to Lindsey Graham on the political spectrum, and people were generally okay with that. And I think what he has demonstrably proven is Americans are okay 
with a strong American uh, capability and capacity, which is absolutely needed for, for dealing with, with, with uh, all the problems we see in the world today. And, and we saw a demonstrative example of that, where we actually had Congress come back in an authorization bill and put in a number for a defense bill, which far exceeded what the president put in. And as a matter of fact, it was such a marker that we expect that the president's next defense budget is going to be higher than that, even though that's exactly what they didn't want to do. They wanted to essentially go back to, to, to Obama-type defense numbers. So I think that's important in terms of where is America going. Um, the, other, the other marker, and I'll just end on this, is Afghanistan. There's a lot of diversity and a lot of debate in the United States about whether we should have been in Afghanistan, whether we shouldn't be, whether we should leave, whether we should stay. Nobody liked how we left. Nobody. And whatever they thought about America's role in the world, nobody wanted to see America embarrassed, taken advantage of, or to see honest people who were just trying to live their lives be the victims of a stupid decision. I think that's the foundation of a relatively robust American foreign policy. I, I think the majority of Americans will support that. I think that's what we've learned from the, the last decade. And I, I think because of what's going on in state and local governments, that will be the direction that drives the country regardless of, of what the dithers of, of a Washington um, might be. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, the current policies that are really structured around the global issues of things like you know climate um, equality or equity that, that that really animate this administration, which again very reflective of the Obama administration, uh, and and really almost ignore or avoid or wish to erase the substance of geopolitics. I don't think that is sustainable. The question is what comes after that, and I I think it is something that looks more like what we saw before 2020. Um, an America that is engaged uh, and, it, and does move forward to protect its, its, its own vital interests, whether that comes from putting new leaders in place or forcing the leaders who are in place to be more realistic, I'm not sure. Um, and that remains to be seen. But I, I think the notion that America is going to uh, opt out of great power competition uh, is not going not to hold true in the long term. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carafano, for uh, opening speech and also for very uh, diligently keeping time. You even <laughs> had some time left, so perhaps you will have some uh, time for some reflections from you after we finish the, the panel. Uh, usually I would start with uh, uh, the woman in the panel, but uh, if my <laughs> information is, is correct, then uh, Dr. Peter, Peter Staroy might have to leave before the panel ends, so I would like to start with him. Uh, Mr. Staroy had a very distinguished career, almost 30 years career uh, now, uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, dealing with uh, mostly with NATO and transatlantic affairs. Uh, you have held uh, very distinguished roles uh, since the since the 19s, basically, uh, I will just say a couple of them. Uh, you were a political official at the Hungarian mission, permanent representative to NATO in the 90s. Uh, you headed the NATO section in the foreign ministry. Uh, you were also deputy permanent representative to the NATO in the 2000s, uh, and uh, uh, a political director, deputy state secretary in the foreign ministry from 2010 and 2015, uh, and of course. Uh, a permanent representative of Hungary to NATO from 2013 to 2018. Uh, and currently you are serving as a state secretary for security policy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Uh, I would kindly like to ask you to make your speech and also perhaps if you have any reflections on what uh, Mr. Carafano was saying, then uh, reflect on that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, having invited me to today's uh, conference. I think it's, it's, it's very topical to discuss transatlantic relations these days. And I guess when uh, you have started the preparation of this conference and you put up different uh, topics for this, uh, nobody was aware uh, what would happen these days. So <clears throat> I think it gives a special importance for this conference uh, today. Now you listen to my CV uh, and uh, it's clear it's a very boring CV because I had three tours at NATO. <laughs> And that's not very typical for a Hungarian diplomat, but it happened to me, half by chance, half by my will. 
And uh, I saw uh, NATO in three different uh, uh, historical ages, basically. One in the 90s, when we were preparing for membership, we were invited and we joined NATO uh, in an enthusiastic, optimistic uh, post-Cold War uh, era. Then the second time I was there as deputy permanent, it was uh, the age of uh, post 9-11, a very different NATO actually. Uh, preparing uh, to fight terrorism everywhere, uh, going to Afghanistan and putting all this into the uh, focus. And then the third time, between 2013 and 2018, it was again a different NATO. And uh, I think uh, some people in the room worked uh, together with me there. So you remember that this was a different NATO, uh, uh, changing, uh, shifting the focus uh, from uh, terrorism uh, from these types of challenges towards uh, China and other uh, issues. But why, why I am uh, telling this in my introduction? Because uh, it means that uh, NATO has adapted uh, very well, actually, in the post-Cold War era. It uh, set up priorities which are still valid, I, I think. I mean, Article 5, collective defense, of course, remained the first and, and foremost, or almost the most important uh, uh, priority. And we have some other things like partnerships, which is equally important, uh, and uh, other issues uh, in the limelight. Today, if we speak about uh, the transatlantic relationship and US leadership, I think uh, uh, it's not so easy to to evaluate what the real situation than it was uh, 20, 15 years ago. And uh, especially uh, when you think about how European defense have developed in the past few years, and you compare that with NATO's development, the question is what is the US relationship and what is the US leadership here? Last year, there were at least three uh, big decisions, unilateral decisions or decisions made in small circles, which had an impact on uh, the confidence within the alliance. Uh, one is uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I, I think uh, uh, the reason why uh, the US decided to withdraw uh, was the right reason. The way how it happened did not uh, uh, strengthen confidence among allies because it was a unilateral decision, although we talk a lot about uh, effective multilateralism and all this, but still the decision was made and announced unilaterally and allies had to adapt themselves to this uh, uh, situation, which uh, was a fait accompli. The second one was uh, the decision on Nord Stream 2. Uh, and, and I'm not uh, judging these decisions. I'm just telling that this had an impact on the perception of confidence of uh, many allies uh, in NATO. Nord Stream 2, which was basically a uh, behind the scenes agreement of uh, Russia, Germany and the US. And all of a sudden, some countries, especially in the eastern flank of NATO, were very much surprised that this happened. And the third one was AUKUS, which was mentioned by the Right Honorable Prime Minister uh, Abbott too. AUKUS, which again, I'm not judging, but the way how it happened and the way how France was surprised did not have a positive impact on cohesion within NATO. I'm telling this, uh, these are three examples which, uh, which are of great importance geopolitically, but these did not help uh, the cohesion within NATO. On the other hand, I think uh, NATO remained uh, united. NATO remained united not only on, uh, on issues regarding uh, these, uh, what I mentioned, but also on the whole question of how we relate to the East. And we have to be clear that within NATO, we have very different threat perceptions. So uh, a prime minister uh, in the southwest uh, of NATO would have very different opinion about what's the, the major or primary threat uh, against his country than a prime minister in the Baltic states, for example, or even here in Hungary. <clears throat> we have uh, 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 lots of experience in uh, shaping and uniting these different approaches by, by uh, individual NATO countries. And I think since the annexation of Crimea, the past eight years, NATO was able to present a united position on many issues. And countries which are less sensitive on uh, Eastern challenges, uh, they were able and ready to join forces and to join consensus and to contribute to the decisions uh, strengthening the Eastern flank of the alliance. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, countries in the eastern flank uh, who have, uh, who had at least uh, not until uh, un until the past few months ha had no experience or less experience with southern challenges like migration or uh, terrorism, they joined forces on decisions and they joined consensus on decisions regarding these uh, threats and challenges. So we were able to do that. Uh, I think Hungary took its part in that very seriously because we pro we supported all the decisions in term, in the spirit of solidarity to uh, strengthen NATO's eastern flank, to send uh, NATO troops uh, to these countries, to send NATO infrastructure to these countries. Uh, at the same time, we also demanded that we have a double approach because we have witnessed a very serious uh, threat and challenge in 2015 and since that through the illegal uncontrolled mass migration that hit Hungary, hit the region, and which was a shock for us in terms of our security. So there is this balance, and I think we have to work on that on a daily basis to build solidarity and uh, to contribute to the security of each and every uh, NATO member. And we have to do this with uh, less ideology and more pragmatism. That's very important. You also mentioned in your introduction or uh, in your points uh, in the preparatory paper, uh, energy. Energy is a very good example of, uh, of, uh, of challenges here in the region. We have a historical legacy because uh, we are exposed to Russian energy supplies. I think in the past 30 years we have done a lot on our own to change that in terms of route and uh, source diversification, but we're still not there. And partly the reason for this is that we have not received sufficient support from the West, uh, uh, including the US, mm -hmm. to build that necessary infrastructure which is uh, uh, unavoidable or which is inevitable for the sake of diversifying your uh, sources. We have built infrastructure in Central Europe uh, north, uh, south, between uh, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Hungary, and all this is there, but that is uh, not sufficient for a breakthrough, and that's what we have to work on. I have some bad examples, like uh, the one on the Neptune uh, uh, field, gas field in, in Romania. We have been waiting for years for a decision by Exxon to uh, have exploitation of, of these fields, and now there's a change of uh, uh, of the, the business scheme and we will still have to wait years until that will be a realistic uh, diversification uh, source for us. So what was a breakthrough uh, last year was the Kirk uh, LNG terminal. I think that's very important. It's not a big amount of gas, but it's still a game changer because that's a uh, new molecule, not from Russia, it's uh, LNG terminal. And then if we continue the building of, of different types of uh, pipes uh, towards the north, I think we will have more options to do that. But there is a high level of exposure, so we have to take into account in our decisions when we look at Russia. And that's very important. So it's not enough to say that Russia has to be sanctioned because Russia is uh, tough on, on Ukraine and all this, but we have to take into, uh, take into account these realities. Uh, in Central Europe. And we need reliable supplies. And I have to tell you that Russia in the past 30 years was and has been a reliable partner. What we agreed upon, uh, they observed uh, the agreements and they supplied us with the necessary gas. Now in the green transition period, it's even more important to have the gas as a transition tool. We are also building nuclear uh, uh, capabilities, I mean, uh, nuclear uh, energy capabilities. Uh, and these two will make our autonomy much wider and much deeper uh, than it was uh, before. Uh, but we need more diversification and we need uh, more cooperation by the hub. Even the Three Seas Initiative has not uh, brought any breakthrough in that respect. We joined the Three Seas Initiative. We are supporting the fund uh, for projects with 20 million euros, which is a significant amount on our behalf. But the projects that have been uh, selected until now do not support the breakthrough in energy diversification. So it's a problem and we have to deal with it. Uh, on Ukraine, of course, this is the most important, most topical issue here uh, in the region right now. Uh, from a Hungarian point of view, we, are, uh, we, we want to avoid by any means a conflict, a new conflict. And we don't think that any of the stakeholders has an interest in uh, escalating this. But, uh, uh, on the contrary, the steps taken by the different stakeholders are, in some parts at least, escalatory. So when we see that 
there is a, a high level tension and there are decisions to evacuate civilians from uh, the so-called Donbas republics, that's an escalatory uh, step. When we see that uh, Western embassies withdraw from Ukraine and withdraw their staff, evacuate basically, that's escalatory step. When we see that uh, countries are moving our, uh, their members' embassies to the west of Ukraine. That's an escalatory uh, step. And also, UK and US withdrawing from the OSCE monitoring mission. It's a huge escalatory step. And I think it's very regrettable, actually, because the monitoring, monitoring mission's role is to be there to see what's happening on the front line, what's happening in the eastern part of Ukraine. And of course, there's a harsh uh, war rhetoric uh, in the press and by some governments, which is not helping to ease tensions, to lower the level of tension and to go back uh, to the uh, table. So that's why we welcome all the efforts, bilateral, multilateral, for uh, talks. I think there is still an openness on behalf of the Russians. Uh, Ukraine is, of course, open for that. Uh, Western uh, governments uh, want to have uh, talks, more talks, and we hope that we can avoid a new uh, uh, a new big conflict. Uh, Hungary mm, has not asked for any further troops uh, to be deployed in Hungary. We think that we have uh, uh, sufficient capabilities together with NATO and we still hope that the conflict can be avoided. But we have, uh, for example, US troops on a rotational basis coming here, exercising, uh, but this is not directly connected with the present uh, high level of tension. Mm -hmm. And we support Ukraine, we support the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Don't misread the Hungarian policy with that. Uh, the reason why we do not support high-level political meetings of the uh, NATO-Ukraine uh, Commission is that Ukraine has adopted several laws in the past few years which go against the inclusion of some parts of society, especially uh, national minorities, including the Hungarian national minority community. And that is a problem because we think that Ukraine should adopt reforms which include all parts of society that will make Ukraine stronger, that will make Ukraine more resilient. But unfortunately, what we see is going a little bit against uh, that and going the other direction, and we cannot accept that. So if they change that, we will change our policy. But in the meantime, in practical terms, we support Ukraine. And I think it was just uh, today in the morning announced by, by Minister Siyarto that we are um, providing Ukraine again uh, with more than uh, 120 um, ventilators <clears throat> to fight the pandemic. I think that's uh, symbolically important, but we have done a lot more things. And from the 1st of February, uh, we can supply from Hungary, uh, Ukraine, with a significant amount uh, of gas uh, through the interconnector, which is good. But we need the big powers uh, to save this problem. Defense spending in Hungary is on the right path. Uh, since uh, 2014, since the Wales Summit of NATO, we have embarked upon a new policy because before that our defense spending was really low and this was a shame. But by now, I think we have done a lot. Uh, Gaspar Marot is not here, but uh, we know very well that Hungary will live up to the pledge to reach the two percent level uh, in defense spending GDP wise by 2024. And we have already reached the 20 percent development and uh, procurement level, which is, I think, exemplary. And other European nations are doing the same, most of them. So we hope that NATO, the European pillar, can become uh, stronger in this respect by 2024, and we can maintain that level of defense spending, because without that, Europe is not credible vis-a-vis -vis the US. And I think President Trump was really right in, in that. He pushed it very hard, and uh, the fruits of this uh, campaign are already visible. I think I would uh, stop here, although there are many other aspects of uh, the transatlantic relationship. But for the time being, I just want to confirm that Hungary is a committed NATO member. We are joining consensus wherever we, we can. We show solidarity to our partners. And we would also count on more solidarity uh, with every Hungary, for example, on issues like the one with regard to the Hungarian minority, minority community in Ukraine. Thank you very much. And if there are questions, I will. Thank you very much, Mr. Starry. Uh, we completely understand if you have to leave, so please, uh, when you have to go, just uh, uh, excuse yourself and, and uh, you're more than welcome to leave. Uh, now I would like to pass the floor to uh, Rieka Semerkényi, uh, 
who is of course also uh, who has of course also a very distinguished uh, career behind her uh, uh, in the transatlantic uh, relations and in the Hungarian foreign ministry. Uh, you are currently the senior advisor in uh, transatlantic trans strategy at the International Republican Institute. Uh, I was had the opportunity to join one of your programs, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and uh, we managed to work together a bit, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> of course, before that, you were um, also the executive vice president of uh, CIPA in uh, DC, Washington DC. And before that, uh, you were the Hungarian ambassador uh, to the United States between 2015 and 2017. And uh, previous to this, uh, you hold uh, various uh, very senior government positions uh, in the Hungarian uh, diplomacy. Uh, for example, you were the chief advisor on foreign and security policy to, the, to Prime Minister Viktor Orban, and also previously a senior advisor to the Ministry of Defense in Hungary. You also had some uh, distinguished career in um, the business sector as um, you were working for the uh, Hungarian gas, gas and oil company, Moil, the Moil Group, um, and also as a consultant to the World Bank. Um, uh, you also have some teaching experiences <laughs> at uh, several universities, uh, including um, uh, in Milan <clears throat> and the, in the Karl University and the Catholic University here in Budapest. Um, so thank you for being here, and uh, please uh, give us your 50-minute uh, speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you for the organizers for this fantastic event. I couldn't be happier when I saw the invitation and the program. I thought, wow, finally, we're getting to discussing a very strategic and very important issue. So I'm super happy to be here, and I'm super happy to have good, good friends around the table. Jim, it's great to have you uh, here in Budapest. We've been long looking forward to it, and it's, I think this is going to give us a great opportunity to go into depth in many strategic issues at the table here and then hopefully in the breaks as well. And also uh, to start a discussion that I think is, is, uh, is, um, is painfully missing uh, from these foreign and security policy discussions in, uh, uh, in here. So I thought that this uh, topic is just fantastic. And the question that we have to discuss today at the table is really the, the question of the decade or of maybe the whatever century. Because we need to understand what is really happening now. There are massive changes globally that we can see, both uh, um, in the shifting sort of dynamics of Russian moves in the world, China uh, that is taking place, and now, you know, full force uh, uh, with a completely new sort of foundations of, of thinking with the situation that is uh, unfolding in Ukraine. We need to understand well whether this is some kind of a small scale carving out more, you know, more benefits on the sides by some states? Uh, or is it just an insignificant minor kind of muscle showing? Is it like skirmishes on the, on the, around the edges that, that are you know, sort, of, sort of coming into the surface? Or is there a more strategic development behind? Is there something deeper? Is there something that we really have to calculate and see well, you know, what it is going to lead to? And it's not a, a theoretical question. It's not a question for teaching at the universities. It's a question for decision makers, because if we do not understand correctly what is taking place, what is unfolding in front of our eyes, we are not never going to be able to develop the proper answers. So we risk developing wrong policy solutions, wrong, uh, following wrong strategic priorities if you don't understand what's behind the changes of the day. So with this, what is it? Is it return and transformation of geopolitics? I really like your title, John. So thank you so much for that, because it's really inspiring. Return in many ways, return of something that never really went away. And I think it's a return in, in terms of seeing more uh, effects of a geopolitical consideration uh, structure and set of, of considerations then for some time, but it's really something that was with us for a long time. Although I think the first year for seeing this was really 2014, for many uh, it was 2014, uh, which was kind of pushing it, the uh, invasion of the Crimea, uh, which really made it clear that this old fashioned uh, power plays are not over. And uh, the United States and Europe really found this disturbing, unsettling, uh, unclear, 
Um, because since the end of the Cold War, obviously, the whole sort of logic of Western thinking has been um, to shift international relations away from this zero-sum gaming and develop win-win situations, develop cooperative structures in which there is a, a possibility for all actors to, to gain and in, uh, strengthen their positions. To be sort of pulled back into these old-style contests are we're just completely unappealing, which I think partly explains the weak rela uh, reactions to, um, to the developments. Um, but certainly what we have seen since 1990 was not what many thought in the West of kind of a, a, a collapse of, of the Soviet Union uh, bringing itself. It was not the uh, disappearance of hard power and not the disappearance of uh, geopolitical uh, considerations and not uh, the end of geopolitics uh, for sure, despite the hopes that the, from then on, of course, only rogue states would threaten us and that the shift of, uh, of uh, foreign policy priorities would go towards climate change, international trade, um, non-proliferation, uh, and other uh, similar uh, issues. Um, but the uh, continued uh, presence of the uh, geopolitical um, pressures in international decision making very uh, strongly coming to the fore. Um, what we can see now is that there are powers um, and there are considerations that show that the current status quo, that status quo that was developed after the end of the Cold War, is not seen as an acceptable and unchallengeable one by all actors, quite the opposite. Um, uh, Russia and China both has intentions and uh, clear foreign policy strategies and, and priorities expressed to uh, not to accept they are taking secondary role in the international system, but to go and, uh, and not become rule takers, but enter as rule set setters in the international system. And they also agree on in another point is that the other point is that the US, the American power is the biggest obstacle for them to achieve this. Uh, maybe a revisionist, we can call this, but these uh, foreign policy goals. And it's not just a, it's both on both ends. They, uh, they uh, see it both as an offensive uh, challenge as a defensive one because they worry that Washington might act in a way to weaken their power uh, further and to uh, undermine their uh, positions. Um, so, but none of them, uh, and the last point that is common in them, that none of them uh, are strong enough yet, or strong enough now, to challenge the status quo upfront and openly. So what they try to do is, is just to sort of chip away, to take away little bits and pieces of, uh, of, um, of the strength of the Western uh, logic and the Western structures and inst political institutions. Uh, chip away in interests, in positions, in geostrategic uh, uh, priorities, uh, in the strength of allies. So um, I think it's a very in interesting uh, um, sort of conflict of mentalities because Europe seemed to want to remain in this post-Cold uh, War logic of, uh, of cooperation, uh, whereas Europe was itself the target of geopolitical considerations. Europe could not, cannot go away from this situation. Europe cannot pretend like maybe until 1990 in the Cold War it could, that all the big conflicts are sort of above Europeans' heads and the Russians and the Americans are going to work it out in some ways. And we in Europe can just quietly remain under the radar, do our businesses, focus on economics, cooperation, um, aid, and then hope that everything is gonna go away. Europe is very much in the focus of these geopolitical revisionist agendas, which is what makes Europe's situation a lot less comfortable and a lot more complex uh, for the uh, decades to come. So if we take a look at the situation currently unfolding un, uh, in the Ukraine, this is what we see. It just is a clear proof of the return of, geop uh, of geopolitical considerations. I would like to add a little footnote here because I think there is a very important new development that we don't have time now to go into, but I'm happy to maybe in the question and answer period. I think what he, we have seen as a reaction, which is the second part of your panel's topic, the transformation of geopolitics, it's not just... Um, 
that it has new tools uh, like cyber, which is now apt actively among the geopolitical tools uh, for any state. But I think there's an another new logic unfolding in, in, in the case of handling the pressures on Ukraine, which is that there's a second battle that is, uh, that is visible. It's in the intelligence world. It has never been so clearly uh, um, uh, sort of driving the decisions that a lot of newly declassified intelligence is put into the media which um, is com completely unprecedented. Previously, these informations that we can see in the media are completely, you know, previously it would have been totally, you know, uh, classified. This uncharacteristic transparency of foreign policy decisions uh, made some expert call this the uh, deterrence by disclosure strategy of going public by the uh, Biden administration with the intelligence uh, um, results and thereby deterring Russia to actually accomplish what they did. And I think it's a, this, uh, of course, this is a, this can have big payoffs if it works, uh, if it actually forces uh, changing tactics. Uh, it's not without risk, but I think it's a new phenomenon, this openness and this intelligence, this use of intelligence in the public sphere, which I think is, is fascinating. Um, and I would like to finish just on uh, one um, conclusion sort of for our discussion today. It's that what we can see now, skipping all this, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, what we can see now is absolutely uh, clearly a uh, return and transformation of geopolitics um, in the sense that it never really left, uh, in the sense that it has new trans, uh, trans new tools added to it, but also a new uh, uh, tactical sort of considerations in the form of using intelligence. And in this sense, I think Central Eastern Europe uh, could not be, in some ways, in a better position because, although it seems to be on the frontier of these uh, of these efforts, and also clearly, as Europe is in the focus of of these geopolitical positions, Central Europe is even more in the focus of these uh, pressures. But Central Eastern Europe made a huge step forward in this very profoundly geostrategic sense of closing that part of its history where it actually was dragging back and forth between powers left and right, east and west. Central Eastern Europe managed to seal itself, to anchor itself into Western in in institutional, uh, infrastructural, less infrastructure, but so even so whatever, developing, and value system. And I think it was a very important, clear geostrategic consideration, closing a part of this history and absolutely making uh, clear uh, its geostrategic positions. Um, all those decisions that were made in the 1990s and then carried out and completed by the uh, EU and NATO enlargement and then fulfilled in the framework uh, are coming to a test now because this is the moment when they all become important. This is now that all of the, uh, the decisions and uh, ref reforms of the uh, military, of the armed structures, of financing the military, control over the military, all of this um, economic developments will become actually strategically super important. So Central Eastern Europe, I think most countries are by and large sensing this massive shift. They are understanding how they have uh, what potential they have in using their EU and NATO memberships, in uh, strengthening their strategic positions and stability, even in the face of a, a strong uh, external pressure. Um, and on this note, I will finish, and I am open to questions, and I look forward to it. I just think that the, we're in a situation very much similar to what we had in we were in in 1990, when a lot of major sort of geopolitical decisions had to be made. All of the countries were fighting those discussions and we had referenda, NATO membership, EU membership. But all the decisions made in the 1990s were actually paving the way or defining our international positions, all of the countries of the region, defining for a good two decades. All of the steps that were made afterwards unfolded from those decisions made in the early 1990s. And now with all these geostrategic shifts of China's movements and Russia's movements and whatever is happening, visibly and invisibly, um, we're again making some fundamental decisions about the next decades. And I very much believe that all the decisions made today in Central Europe will similarly define our path, our future for the next two or three decades. So I think it's strategically important. And thank you for this wonderful conference to start to discuss it. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Rika, for your uh, speech. 
Our next speaker will be uh, Charles Crawford, uh, who is a distinguished uh, former diplomat and uh, also a speechwriter and consultant. Uh, you had a very distinguished career in the Foreign Service of the United Kingdom. Uh, you worked uh, at the British Embassy of Belgrade, um, at the British Embassy in Cape Town, and also at the British Embassy of Moscow. But you are more famous of being the ambassador of, the, of Her Majesty to Sarajevo, and then later to Belgrade and to Warsaw as well. Uh, during your uh, work in Sarajevo, you uh, received the most dis distinguished order of St. Michael and George, uh, CMG, which since, uh, yes, Minister, we know, just means uh, call me God. Uh, so congratulations for that. Uh, and perhaps uh, not all of the people know here that uh, you're also a very distinguished speechwriter. You won the Cicero Awards for speechwriting two times in 2016 and 2017. Uh, and as somebody who actually attended one of your speechwriting courses, I can attest to that. So uh, thank you for being here and uh, please give us your uh, speech. Thank you. Can everyone hear this? It's, everyone here is very clever. It's a very, very big subject, massive subject. And I don't really know what geopolitics is. This is my basic problem. I mean, if it, if it hasn't gone away, can it, not, can it return? I don't know what that means. So instead, I'm going to talk about geopsychology. And this is a new academic discipline which I invented yesterday. <laughs> I did, honestly. And it's very simple. Are you strong or are you weak? The idea of strength and weakness. When I was, um, a couple of years ago, I tried to do a degree in philosophy and I failed. So, but I got into Wittgenstein. And one of the things Wittgenstein sort of says is you can't have a, an idea doesn't make sense if you can't have the opposite of it. So you can't talk about the edge of the universe. That doesn't make sense because you can't step across the edge of the universe to see it from the other side. Do you see what I mean? So strength and weakness go together. And it's a very profound idea. Are you strong? When you're talking about Russia and Ukraine or us and China or any of the issues which the panel have talked about, are you strong or weak? Are they strong or weak? Do they think that you're strong? Or do they think that you're weak? And do they think that they're strong? Or do they think that they're weak? And do you think that you're strong? And what if you think you're strong but, it, but you're not? You see, there's a lot of possible permutations here, guys, about how people look at each other. So this is in some ways often called the first piece of conceptual art. Does anyone know what it is? I don't expect the ladies to know. <laughs> exactly. An artist called Marcel Duchamp, who's very important in Western art, put this toilet in an art gallery about a hundred years ago. It was a huge revolution. You can imagine it was. And the, this is in Afghanistan. And is it James, is it? You, you talked about embarrassment. I mean, what's interesting about this is when you look at it from the point of strength and weakness, how did we our civilization reached the point where we were sending this beautifully spoken English young lady at really incredible expense. You think about the consultancy contracts this would have involved to get her there, the security. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars for this program. And yet it's completely insane what they're trying to do. <clears throat> I mean, but, but it sort of it, it suggests a degree of uh, I mean, I don't know what the word is, the almost corruption in a sense, that we're, we've lost the plot. And so anyone in Afghanistan looking at that and anyone in Russia looking at that would think, what on earth are these people doing? What do they think they're doing? Now, compared to that, 
we have this. And this, I think, is very difficult. And I think the, the, the other speakers have sort of hinted at this. We're tougher than you can imagine. This is the idea of Soviet negotiating. But it has a gloss on it. We'll take more pain than you will inflict. What you do to us, we will do worse to you. I was in Moscow at the, I'm one of the people who wrote the rules for the, I guess, for the transition from communism in, in Europe. And I was in Moscow and I wrote the speech for John Major when he went to um, the uh, 1995, the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And I looked at the numbers. And we lost in the Second World War, we the British, 600,000 people. That's a, that's a lot, but it wasn't like the First World War, obviously. The Russian, the Soviets lost something like that in the last week of the war attacking Berlin. We can take more pain than you can possibly imagine, let alone than you are pre prepared to inflict on us. So the, the aim here is psychological dominance. It's playing a weak card very powerfully so that everyone backs off. The uh, Russian government is explaining that um, he's fighting... Uh, Putin is so sure Czechia. of his hold over European uh, countries that when, during so a summit, a French journalist criticizes the war in Chechnya, he hits back, but... ...killing hundreds of people. Given this, don't you think that by trying to eradicate terrorism in Chechnya, you are going to eradicate the uh, civilian population of Chechnya? <laughs> I mean, this is an astonishing thing. 2002, right? I mean, we can't say we weren't warned. This is 20 years ago. And the point is here, really, I think, I mean, you can analyze this and like the other video for a whole conference, but, the, but what he's doing is putting down a psychological marker. You Europeans, nice cappuccino, fancy conference halls, you know, gender diversity. All that's fine. You come to Russia if you dare. That's what he's saying. And unlike this prime minister, these guys didn't, what's that expression? They didn't shirt front him. They sat there looking completely lost and baffled. And these are European leaders in public, in front of the world. And to be fair, the world's journalists seem pretty stunned as well. And this is, when I was learning, trying to learn Polish, I read an article about uh, an interview with Putin in, in a Polish magazine. And I think this is the thing to understand. He said, someone, they asked him, what's your policy? He says, to keep what's ours. That is so profound. Russians are very good at these little insights. To keep what's ours. Because that's a very, if you like, clever but passive aggressive way of explaining what's going on here because he can say look you you know just like he said to the prime minister i'm a real russian are you a real australian you ukrainians ours or are you saying that it's yours and we really can't say ukrainians ours in the way that he can on some level and that sort of gives him a, a, a sort of authority to do what the hell he likes now, I just looked at the numbers yesterday. These are sort of quite interesting. If you look at 1990, when sort of communism ended, the United States has just carried on growing. China, after a slow start, really got going around 2005 and has gone up to now, what is it, $16 trillion economy. These are the figures from the World Bank I've picked up on the internet yesterday. Russia, bumping along the bottom there, and it was sort of doing quite well until all this... Ukraine stuff started, right? And then it's sort of gone down. So Russia in 2020 is 
it's sort of below its peak in 2006. So it's lost a lot of money. You're talking tri you know, a trillion or so dollars. But that's not what it's really lost. It's lost the opportunity cost of growing. If Russia had grown, carried on growing, not like obviously like China, but had carried on growing like it was in 2010, it might be up to about five or six trillion dollars now. So this idea of sanctions, look how much they've lost. And they keep going. <laughs> so this isn't a sort of policy question. It's a psychological question. It's a conflict of mentalities, as the last speaker beautifully put it. I was in Belgrade a few, two or three months ago, really. And I was, met this senior Serbian official who I knew when I was ambassador. I hadn't seen him for years. And we went out for a chat. And he said he went to China. And he's sitting there with some official. And the official pushes across the table an envelope with $100,000 in it. And said, it's just a present for you. And he said, you know, I'm terribly sorry, I can't take it. That's what he told me. But, <laughs> but, I, but I actually don't think he did. But, it, but just imagine, you know, one of the things we're talking about, the transformation of geopolitics. Once upon a time, there wasn't that much money in the world. And now there's a lot more money. There are lots and lots of countries with far more money because of the end of communism. So if you're running some sort of security organization in China and you say to the authorities there, give us five billion, it's a rounding error on their economy. They can give $100,000 to 50,000 people around the world in key positions. And not even, it's small change. You know, everyone in this room would be tempted if you pushed $100,000 across the table. But imagine what that buys in universities, in politics, in sport, that, that sort of money, just casually pushed across the table, buys everything. And, and would you know it was happening? No, you wouldn't. So this is all basically very simple. Geopsychology geo comes down to this. Are there rules? <laughs> Who decides the rules? and who tries to enforce them. This, this, is, this is it. And I think the point, again, as the last speaker said, if I can say so, is that the, you get a sense the rules are fraying. The rules, sort of logic of the post-Cold War settlement seems to be unwinding because of Western weakness and so on and so on. But also because of you know, the role of tech companies and the impact of the COVID crisis and so on and so on. You know, all of a sudden, there seems to be a convergence in state willingness to oppress citizens that simply wasn't there before. So this is it. This is all this is. Now, who said this? What if there aren't actually any rules? What happens if you bring in anarchy and you upset the, upset the established order and you get a sort of mess? And what's the thing about chaos? It's fair. Why is it fair? Because rules are set up by people like us. We like rules. But there are other people out there who don't like the rules because they don't want the world we want. And what if they are undermining these rules? Who said this? Come on, you. There must be someone in this audience who knows the answer to this question. Otherwise, I will resign. Yep. <laughs> Was it the Joker? Thank you. <laughs> the Joker. Very good. Give this guy a pay rise. But, the, but think about what that means in a philosophical sense. It's a very, very profound idea. Don't underestimate it. Are we moving to a world without rules because it's fair? Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very innovative uh, speech. I think we can see why you received the CCO of awards uh, twice. <laughs> uh, you will see that we have two changes in the program. 
uh, one I should have uh, said in the beginning of the panel, but I sadly forgot, is that uh, we made a mistake. So Dr. Nemeth is actually going to speak after the panel. He's not speaking in the panel as a separate speech. And uh, the second one is not a mistake, but sadly our original participant, uh, whose name I will most likely pronounce uh, <laughs> Uh, not correctly, but I will still try. Uh, Thomas uh, Gr Grivanchevsky uh, had to go to the Ukraine, sadly. And we are very grateful that uh, instead of him in the last minute, really, uh, Marek Matrasek, uh, Matrasek, an old friend of John and the New Institute, could uh, join us today. Um, Marek is, of course, uh, the chairman of the CEC group, uh, which is uh, the leading public affairs and political communications brand in Central Europe today. Uh, which gives uh, strategic political intelligence and analyze, analysis and advocacy services for major US, UK and other European multinational companies in the region. Uh, you have Polish roots. Uh, you uh, went, to the, went to Poland in the early 90s, uh, where you set up uh, CEC already in the 90s. Uh, and since have been, I guess, uh, moving around between Poland and, and the UK and Europe. Uh, you are also a distinguished writer. Uh, you regularly uh, publish uh, uh, on Polish and international affairs for uh, distinguished journals like the Poland Monthly, the Warsaw Business Journal, the Spectator, or the Warsaw Journal Europe. Uh, so thank you for being here, especially on the short notice, and uh, please give us your speech. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very, um, thank you very much, Istvan, for that um, <laughs> superfluous introduction. I, I, I am at the, uh, here at the last moment, and I will try to do my best at the listener of John's request at this fascinating meeting. And I do congratulate John and the entire Danube Institute team for this uh, very timely, and uh, I think, given the quality of people on the, uh, not just on the panel but in the audience, I'm very much looking forward to the. Conclusions, or at least the thoughts that we all um, discuss over the course of the day, and my my sort of modest role in this panel is is really to give you what I would say is the Polish Polish perspective, uh, perhaps the Central European perspective, but primarily the Polish perspective on uh, not just on Ukraine, although obviously that will be a major part of of what I will sort of is in the background of everything that we're saying. Uh, but in, in the context of what was, has already been identified as the question of, of how, how will the current crisis affect the geopolitical order in, what, in, 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 in an environment which has dramatically shifted in the last six months uh, through, through Russia's aggressive actions in the region. Now, Poland, um, you know, I think you, if you ask mo most Poles, they will rather immodestly say, uh, that they are well placed to be commenting or be or being or acting or trying to actually set the terms of the current debate, because the historical record of Poland on geopolitics is really exemplary. Um, after 1990 uh, and the dramatic changes that the fall of the Berlin Wall brought about in Europe, uh, it was really Poland that was um, in the driving seat. Uh, in the early 1990s, right up to the NATO membership in uh, 1999, uh, really saying that there is a historical process which not just Poland, but the other Visegrad countries at that point and broader Central Europe needed to re-engage in. And that was to transition from being a satellite state, a vassal state of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact and Comic-Con, and to move into the community of free nations which at that point was obviously exemplified or in institutional terms by, by both NATO and the, e, and the EU. And NATO membership, of, uh, which was achieved by Poland, the uh, Czech Republic and Hungary and later Slovakia, and obviously in future years by other Central European states, was really driven by Poland. Uh, it, the, the expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe was not a foregone conclusion, despite the fact that it was much desired by the countries of Central Europe. There were strong forces in Germany, uh, in the United States, and even in the United Kingdom throughout Europe and, and the transatlantic community questioning whether or not that made sense. And it was Poland through a very efficient uh, campaign, persuasion, lobbying within Congress, drove, um, drove that decision to its uh, happy 
uh, a happy climax in, at the end of the 1990s. And Poland was uh, doing, uh, the, the, the message that Poland was saying is this was a process which was not just in Poland's interest, but it was in the interests of the broader European, commu uh, European uh, community, but also it was a process which sooner or later had to engage uh, countries which were part of the former Soviet Union itself. Not just the Baltic states, of course, because uh, uh, that, 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 was, that was clear, but also it was a process that slowly but surely had to encompass uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. These are all countries which had to be brought back into the um, European orbit and into the, into the NATO fold in due course. And um, in Ukraine in particular is an interesting case because this was a, uh, a re the relationship between Poland and Ukraine had not been a happy one uh, in the interwar period. And even during the Second World War, there was ethnic tensions in what is now uh, Belarus and, and Western Ukraine, the famous Volin massacres. These were very sad periods in the Polish-Ukraine relationship. But uh, after the war, there was a heroic effort made by Polish intellectuals, both not just within Poland, obviously, where discussion was, was, was impossible, but in the emigre community in Paris and London to reforge a new uh, rapprochement between Poland and Ukraine uh, on the basis that only an independent Ukraine, only a, a, a sovereign Ukraine could be a guarantor for European security, for Polish independence as a bulwark against, uh, against a possibly revanchist or expansionist uh, Russia and or Soviet Union at that point. And so Poland uh, had led the way, not just in terms of moving Central Europe uh, into the West, but also acting as a spokesman for the interests of the former nations, uh, former subjugated nations within the, within the Soviet Union and, and especially Ukraine. And, uh, and Poland, frankly, put its money where its mouth was. This was not just rhetoric. Uh, but throughout the 1990s and 2000s, in fact, throughout the last 30 years, Poland has done much to talk about not just the importance of expanding NATO, but also keeping NATO focused on what uh, is the goal of NATO. Uh, it's the security of, of its, its members, of course, but it's also an awareness and a constant reminding of the values which NATO represents and the threats which challenge NATO. And those threats are military threats, of course, from, from the East, but they're also complex energy challenges, and more recently, complex, uh, complex challenges in the areas of cybersecurity, disinformation, and so on. And, and Poland has been very robust over the last decades in moving forward in all these areas, and, and um, not just military modernization, of course. I, I won't go into the details of the huge resources that Poland has spent on, on um, modernizing its military, on welcoming U.S. troops, uh, albeit uh, hitherto on a rotational basis on its soil, and Poland leading the way in calling for an increase in, uh, uh, in defense spending uh, within NATO, but also energy diversification. Poland in the last decade has done much in the areas of LNG, uh, nuclear, uh, for promoting a nuclear, nuclear program within the country, diversifying sources of gas imports, and challenging also uh, the EU's green energy agenda, which due to a large extent has been driving uh, um, European industry into the hands of dependency on Russian gas and removing from the energy nexus coal, uh, coal and nuclear as a way of, of, of ameliorating those potential, that potential uh, uh, dependency. And also working very hard finally on regional uh, consolidation through the Three Seas Initiative, the uh, Visegrad Four, and also the Bucharest Nine, which is the NATO frontline states working together. Poland has been very in the f in the front line of talking about the need for regional cooperation around these themes of energy diversification, military modernization, and a strengthening of the transatlantic alliance. So Poland, a very strong voice historically, mm -hmm. and well placed um, to be taking a voice now. Now. Um, under the, uh, this particularly was, uh, Poland was particularly vocal during and, and able to articulate these priorities during the Trump administration. The first year of the Biden administration, 
uh, I think it's fair to say Poland um, felt itself shunted aside from the from the geostrategic debate. And this these this very powerful voice in all these areas that I've described were, were not were not at top table. Uh, the initial policy of the Biden administration, uh, certainly throughout the bulk of 2021. Uh, was to uh, refocus on Brussels, refocus on rebuilding the relationship between the United States and Germany on, and France, on the other hand. And really, the sense in Poland was that because of um, the uh, themes that were emerging around rule of law issues in Poland, media freedom issues, cultural issues, all of these were pushing the Biden administration into a posture of... Uh, I, not, not, not essentially isolating Poland, but really not giving Poland the, the due that the Poles felt uh, that they deserved, frankly, for having stated these obvious truths about what the importance of security and the importance of the transatlantic relationship over the last 20 years. And yet Poland's very strong voice was not, um, was not really being taken into account. The Ukraine crisis has changed that. It has changed it substantially. And it's a combination of the Ukraine crisis, the recognition of this almost existential challenge to uh, European security, but also uh, uh, one or two moves the Polish government has made domestically on rule of law and media freedom issues, which have opened up once again uh, the top table back to Poland. Uh, I was in Washington two or three weeks ago talking to the uh, Polish ambassador there, who said that, frankly, it's a sea change. Uh, Poland is now, the voice of Poland is much more deeply regarded in Washington than it was uh, for a long time during the course of last year. In all the areas of which uh, we've been discussing, whether it's sanctions policy uh, on Russia, whether it's the, um, whether it's the military response, uh, Poland has been at the, at the heart of the discussions for the establishment of the sanctions regime. And over the last uh, two or three months, you'll be aware that Poland has ramped up its military relationship with the United States through very significant military procurements. We've had 250 Abrams tanks signed off by Secretary Austin uh, last week in Warsaw. There are Cougar personnel vehicles, and Poland is um, continually investing, and certainly uh, over the last few weeks and months has done a lot to move forward acquisitions in other, in other sensitive areas. And Poland, um, just, uh, just in the last two weeks, the happy recipient of additional US troops by the 101st and 82nd Airborne coming into Poland, particularly in the southeast on, on the Ukrainian border. And uh, on energy, uh, Poland again demonstrating its uh, fidelity to the United States, uh, a, just last week or two weeks ago, there was a major delegation in Washington signing off on nuclear deals for small modular reactors with both GE, Hitachi, and other, uh, other, US, uh, other US nuclear interests. So moving forward on that. And uh, since we're in Budapest, you may be aware that um, just, just recently there was a major agreement signed between Hungary and Poland on the uh, uh, acquisition by Hungary of key petroleum or petrochemical assets of the Lotos company in Poland. Uh, and this is uh, because of the uh, decision of, of the European Commission to order some divestment of assets. But the most important thing about that deal is that alongside Moll's acquisition of Polish petrol stations, Saudi Aramco has taken a substantial stake in the main Polish oil refinery on the North Sea coast, which will allow Poland uh, through the ability now to import Saudi uh, petroleum for refining to wean itself off the dependency on Rosneft for some of its uh, oil. And um, in all these areas, whether it's uh, cyber security, whether it's military, whether it's energy, Poland looking to diversify away from Russia, but also, of course, to uh, strengthen uh, through those policies the, and anchor in Central Europe and in Poland U.S. interests, whether they're commercial interests or whether they're uh, military uh, geopolitical interests. Um, so that's the present. Um, what about the future? And here, I think, 
this is actually what I think is the really interesting part of the debate. We all know what's happening now with Ukraine and Russia and, and, and the Western response, but what comes next? What happens? What, what, where do we stand the day after? And what are the policies that we need to be implementing the day after? And where does Poland and other Central European countries stand on that? I think the, the main, whatever happens in Ukraine, whether it's an invasion, whether it's a long war of attrition, whether it ends in some messy compromise where Ukrainian sovereignty is, is, is abandoned or, 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 or sold off to maintain a false peace with Russia, whichever of those alternatives awaits us, the, the, the truth will be that there will have been a very fundamental paradigm shift in the way Russia is perceived. Um, I, I can't imagine in the future serious Western politicians arguing that Russia is a rational actor, that it can be, uh, that its interests are legitimate, that it's intra, that there is a compromise which can be drawn to establish peace in our time. I think the sense now is that Russia is an aggressive power. It is bent on a reconstruction of its, the former Soviet space. It is led by, uh, ultimately, um, a fanatic, frankly, who is prepared to kill, murder, invade, undermine in order to achieve his goals. So what is to be done in that context of that paradigm shift uh, in the perception of Russia and the geopolitical challenge by Western elites? Well, Poland will say, there are probably five areas, and I'll go through them very quickly uh, in the time remaining, that we, that we need to be doing uh, as in that new geopolitical reality. Number one, military. Military spending up as a percentage of GDP, spending on the right arms, the right equipment, strike capability, intelligence gathering capability, cyber defense capability, air and missile defense, uh, a major challenge because of the possibility that Russian troops now stationed in Belarus will not leave Belarus but will remain. Uh, in other words, Russian cap strike capability moving significantly closer to Western uh, NATO's uh, eastern, eastern flank and obviously with the Baltics as the main challenge. And Poland will be pushing hard not just for military spending but greater US presence in Central Europe, possibly even permanent facing. The current US presence, welcome as it is, is rotational. Uh, Poland will be put, pushing hard for permanent mechanized forces, certainly in itself, and it's prepared, I think, to pay the price of that in terms of the costs that will be involved of establishing permanent US bases. Secondly, invigorating the three C's agenda which is saying you know, to combat the Russian challenge requires not only military means, but also continued energy diversification, uh, continued uh, defense against cyber threats, and increased interconnector infrastructure in Central Europe, in, particularly in energy, and whether it's electricity infrastructure or gas infrastructure, more developed LNG import capability on the Baltic coast and Kurk in Croatia, uh, possibly in Romania, all of these are things that Poland will be pushing for. Thirdly, continued support for Ukraine in whatever shape and form Ukraine finds itself in. Continued military support. We've seen the initial defensive weaponry, javelins, stingers, end law missiles from the UK, uh, as well as continued support and, and helping Ukraine possibly and being openly supportive of any migration pressures that might come from Russian aggression. That's a challenge for the European Union primarily. But Poland, again, will be leading with voices saying that there needs to be an EU-wide strategy for coping with the migration pressures. A continued support for, 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 for Ukraine. Russia itself, keeping sanctions, keeping them at a painful level, keeping the screws on despite the costs that will come and despite the cracks that will undoubtedly appear in, in the West as the Russian counter sanctions, counter measures, whether it's through gas or through other measures that the Russians can impose on Western Europe, will start to bite. Poland will be saying, um, no retreat, keep the screws on Russia, 
uh, until there is a retreat in some form, and, a, and especially, of course, no to any revival of North, North Steam crude. The fifth and final area is, is the EU's approach to Central Europe itself. This is a complex issue. It's not really something that we can spend much time on now. But the EU will have to revise its posture towards Central Europe. It will have to uh, revise the position that Poland, Hungary, other Central European countries have no place at the top table in Brussels. The current crusades which are being waged within Brussels on, uh, on rule of law, media freedom, cultural issues, these are secondary. I mean, not that they're valid in the first place, in my view. But they are today's, in two, today's crisis, that has to be put to one side and the EU has to have have to, has to be fully supportive of those robust positions, uh, robust policies that I just described earlier. And Poland will be looking for allies, not just within Central Europe, but within the, within the rest of Europe as well. U Ukraine has been a tremendous stress test for the West. And, um, and it's shown at the time of crisis who can be relied on, who cannot be relied on. And Poland and other Central European countries are seeing uh, those countries that have, that have come to the party, as they say. It is the United States. Now, I know there are criticisms of the Biden administration uh, on the right, but through the lens of France and Germany, as Poland and Central Europe looks at the West, for all its faults, the Biden administration, certainly in the last couple of months, have performed better than many in Central Europe expected. Uh, and the other ally that's come up in this, in this, in this is the UK. I won't, I won't go into the details, but the, the UK's performance on Ukraine's support for Central Europe, in the, certainly from the perspective of countries like Poland, has been absolutely first rate. Uh, not just verbally, but in terms of engagement of UK military personnel, support for Ukraine in other areas. And we're seeing really the, the rebuilding of what paradoxically, under the Biden administration, a rebuilding of perhaps what is a Trumpian vision of the transatlantic relationship, where you had the primacy of a strong relationship with the UK and a strong relationship with Central Europe, and a more suspicious, as it were, posture of, uh, of both France, uh, France and Germany. And um, so this is the new geopolitical uh, environment in which we will be dealing. So those five goals that I've laid out, military, economic, energy, Russia, sanctions and the EU, this will be, I think, driven by a new alliance which we see forming as we, as uh, uh, forming now, a re-establishment of a strategic relationship of trust. And that is the key word, a relationship of trust, that when we're in trouble, you will come to our aid between the US, the United Kingdom and Central Europe. And I think that is something that absolutely has to be built on in order to achieve those goals that I've laid out. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Marek, for giving us the Polish perspective. And uh, now I think uh, Mr. Carafano has some uh, remarks on the uh, speaker speeches. So please, if yeah, I just I just really wanted to get on the table. You should never trust anyone who quotes the Joker. <laughs> Rather, I, I would point you to, you know, maybe the greatest geopsychological uh, uh, expert of all time, who I think was Cliff Robertson, who played um, Spider-Man's uncle, who said, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, so, you, look, you've probably already forgotten what I said at the beginning, which I, I don't blame you. But um, the, the bottom line was, I think America is going to be back in serious geopolitical competition in a much more muscular way. What I can't tell you... And, and I would agree with you. The, the administration has moved in a decisively more engaged in Europe direction the last couple of months. It's laudable. But whether, whether that continues and, or whether uh, we become more Trumpian in next week or next month or next year or the next three years, I don't know. But I, I do think there are things that we can work on because that is the direction that America moves back into. And my list is also five, which I think he actually stole um, he, for me that we're five things. So... Um, never trust the polls. Okay, that's another one. All right. Um, one is I actually owed a uh, Prime Minister or, uh, Abbott. It was exactly right. Um, uh, and it's this concept of nesting. So, so Asia never didn't have a NATO, right? So what we come up with in, instead, which is this brilliant concept of the Quad, which really the, the genius of the Quad is it sits over a whole bunch of relationships. 
there are trilats and bilats and, and different regional things. And what that actually allows in the Indo-Pacific is a lot of flexibility because no, no instrument is great for everything. Not, not, there's no geopolitical Swiss army knife, but what we actually have in the Asia Pacific is different frameworks that we could jump on and do different things. Europe should take it, a lesson from that. NATO is great for the uh, geopolitical defense of the uh, collective defense of the community, but, um, but it's not a Swiss army knife. And we, we have to become much more sophisticated at using all the other potential relationships we had. The US and EU should be partnering more in the Balkans and the Maghreb. Um, there are things we should be doing bilaterally and trilaterally, particularly in the, in the front space of NATO, that, and NATO can catch up later. So nesting, I think, is an important concept in the transatlantic community that we need to take much more better advantage of. Um, the second one is, is we need an Atlantic strategy. You know, we, you know, we have looked at the Atlantic space as our backyard, and it's never, it has not been a competitive space, really, since 1945. If you look at everything the Chinese want to do from the Arctic to the Antarctic, in Africa and Latin America, in, uh, in Southern Europe, if the Chinese could realize their vision over the next decade, the Atlantic could be a very competitive space. That's not good for you guys. It's not good for us. It's something we need to think holistically about and take seriously. We need real conversations on that. They're not happening from government to government. They need to be at the 1.5 level, at the, the track two level, but we need to be having them and having them now uh, because we can't wait. Um, the third one is, um, I think despite the, 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 um, the impulses of, of the, the, both the Obama and the Biden administration, there's a recognition that strategic deterrence has an important role to play in the world, missile defense uh, and nuclear weapons. Um, and the United States is not going to abandon its strategic arsenal. But this leads to the more important question of extended deterrence, which was a hallmark of, of the Cold War. We, we need to bring extended deterrence back into the game. And, and we need to have co serious conversations about how we make sure that that's true for all the key geostrategic geostrate partners that we have. Um, fourth is, look, transatlantic security um, depends on US and European, Euro Europe working together and fundamentally requires two things. We have to have adequate conventional deterrence for the transatlantic community. And we have to have uh, energy that's reliable, affordable, and abundant. America should be energy independent. Europe should have an ener energy security. Um, and we have to work on those, on those two things together. And those are an absolute non-negotiable priority that have to be done. And, and I, I love the comments on the three C's. We've long been supporters of the three C's. I think it could be a vital component of that. Um, and it needs to be reinvigorated. And the, and the last one is we have to be honest and we have to figure out how to break through the death spiral. So I always call the death spiral. These are the border states of, of Russia, which are caught in the middle. And, uh, you know, hopefully they'll still be a Ukraine, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, Moldova, even Belarus. And you know it goes like this. Um, they nobody wants to be a suburb of Moscow, even if we all, you know, if people want to do business with Moscow. And so they would like the, the solidarity and the security of a Western orientation. And so they move in that direction, and we go, hey, this is awesome. And you know, and then of course the Russians, you know, squirrel things so it can't happen. And then we're like, well, you know, that was fun. You know, come back again if you had a chance, right? And we go through this death spiral cycle. Um, and we have to figure out how do we break out of that. We have to, way, to figure out a way to continue to engage with the, with the Kosovos and the Moldovas and the Belaruses and, and, the, um, and the Ukraines and the Georgias of the world um, if we're going to build a community of like-minded nations, which we, we claim that we are. I think that's a to-do list. You know, nesting, Atlantic strategy, strategic deterrence, energy, conventional deterrence in NATO, and, and dealing with the post-Soviet space that, that doesn't have to wait for the most you know, transatlantic president ever. This is something that we can work on now and something that we can work on together and we should start doing that right away.